Look, for those of you who've walked in, just I'm Stephanie Ryan from the State Library and Family History area. And what we're going to talk about today are some of the queries that people have given us and how we can find some answers. Now, we're hoping that the byproduct for you is that it might actually help you solve some of your issues. We hope. So it's our resources and strategies using the State Library. So unsurprisingly, we're going to go to the State Library website, which changes all the time. I'm going to ho hope that it's not going to be um, too difficult to move around it. Now, th it, there's never a, a, such a situation as the road not taken. Everywhere you want to go, there's a stack of different ways to get to it. So if we want to go to the resources, when we move to the word resources, it drops down underneath. And we want to go to, and you've got to be careful, you can see that I'm not doing it too brilliantly, family history. Now when we go to family history, and I'm going to be very patient, and I'm not going to, yeah, there we go. These are all of our various guides, not all of them, some of the guides. And down here are also the guides, only they're printed out in a format of two or four pages because some people like that rather than lots and lots of links. They just want to print it out. And there are some examples out there on the table of some of those sheets. And in case you haven't got the message, we're very keen that you join up so that you can access some of the resources you couldn't otherwise um, benefit from. We want to go to e-resources, and we go to e-resources at this point once we're into family history. So click on that one and wait extremely patiently. Now what I would really like to do is to do a lot more on this website, only it just tends to be a little bit more uh, time consuming. When you look at this page, this is where we've gathered our websites. One of the constant complaints that we get is that all I can find are websites that charge. These generally don't, and if they are sites like Ancestry, Ancestry Library that is, or um, Find My Past, they're free on site. If it were up to the State Library, they'd be free off-site, but we're obviously constrained by the conditions that these people put on us. Now, you can see here a number of indexes that we um, have done, and there are even more available through our OneSearch. And I'm just going to scroll down here to look at it. The following can be searched through OneSearch, the Convict Transportation Register Database, you know, the one that, um, after spending years on it, Ancestry launched. But we made these data sets available for anyone to use them. And so you will find that various groups have taken that data set and added various things to it. Tyndale, for looking at Aboriginal family history. The World War, uh, sorry, the Boer War photographs. Now, when this was done in 1999, we didn't have all the digitisation options we have now. And this is really just an index. But it will lead you to where to look in the Queenslander. Mining accidents, of course, it was one of the major occupations, mining and railways. The soldier portraits, which we'll be talking about, which have been done as high-quality TIFFs. And the Margaret Laurie genealogies, which is the most recent one to do with the Torres Strait Island um, Islander peoples and you can find that through OneSearch. Our catalogue is more than a place to find books. You can find documents online, books online and photographs online. These are e-resources and you can connect through here to 19th century British newspapers which actually now has a 20th century component. The Times and the Irish Newspaper Archive. That you can look at at home. Now, these are only on site. Ancestry, Find My Past and CD-ROMs. What's going to happen about the CD-ROMs is a matter for speculation at the moment. And you can see here 
um, a list of those CD-ROMs. No, you can't get them at home. I can hear that question bubbling up. And, of course, there are other e-resources. So it's worth having a look at that page and it's worth going through our useful websites. The most recent ones that we have added to our useful websites, of course, is the GRO Online UK. Who has used it? Obviously, I've gone mad on it because it solved one of my problems. But you can see how it's sorted out. It, it's sorted by countries and research aids. And then, of course, what we have within each one are links. So, for example, um, Australian National Maritime Museum, pictures of ships, research guides. We've got biographical and collection databases under the Australian War Memorial, but it's so well linked now that probably isn't necessary. But under, for example, Queensland State Archives, we have links to the guides, the archives and to their indexes. Okay, what I want to take a look at is some of the queries that we've looked at to look at how we might use those resources. And one of them, of course, is John Quinlan. John Quinlan, in 1949, was 17 years of age. He'd finished school at the grammar and un with the recommendation of the grammar principal applied for a teaching fellowship. He'd been born in Queensland. His mother had been born in Queensland. He was a top student, a good sportsman, and of course passed everything with flying colours till the interview. And what they saw was a Chinese face, and then he missed out. Now, you know, this is quite fascinating because I don't know too many 17-year-old kids who would take on the Department of Education, go to the newspapers, and of course there was a huge championing of him. So the question is, whatever did happen to him? His birth and death are outside the ranges of the um, registry. Um, how can we find out about him? And anyone who's ever tried to find anyone with a Chinese background knows the difficulty of the name issue. Surnames become confused with first names and then it's sound issues. Even the place becomes a name. So, here it is, 17, banned. And it goes on to explain, everyone bought into it, everybody. The Director General, Secondary General, sec um, Secondary Inspector of Secondary Schools, you name it, they all got into it. And the Secretary of the Teachers Union said, just axiomatic, basic foundation. You can't have a Chinese or Aborigine teaching in our schools. This is 49, which uh, doesn't seem too long ago to me, and it's extraordinary that it could be as blatant as that, especially when we would consider him to be a Queenslander, born, bred, culturally, everything, and, you know, here, belongs here. So here we've got you know, all of this fuss. And if you read the papers for three or four days, everyone's got an opinion on it. And his brother, Kennedy Quinlan, has bought in um, by saying, oh, look, you've got top um, mathematicians at Sydney University who are full-blooded Chinese. Um, and after four days of this, he said, the Director General of Education has at last sold me his own propaganda that I would be taking up the wrong profession. So he eventually just conceded. So what was going to happen to him? He said, of course, we Chinese only want a fair go. And I thought that was an interesting statement, that even though he was born here and his mother was born here, he identified with being Chinese, even though culturally the links had largely gone. For those of you who may not be aware, there are wonderful records at National Archives and you can connect to those through our useful websites. And there's a sheet about useful websites outside, which is worth having a look at. Now, you get photos of the family because there was a white Australia policy, if not officially, unofficially. So those who wanted to come into the country needed to ex exemption. And you can see the father, whose name actually was Quinlem, and his surname Chong, 
you can actually see him ageing over the years. And of course, what was actually a form of discrimination is something a lot of these people, I've actually seen people burst into tears when they see this because it's the only record in some cases that they have of family members. You can see they're wild radicals, can't you? <laughs> Challenging the system. So sometimes when you're searching for something like this, you need to look under Quinlam as one word and Quinlem. Um, both have been used. But the surname was actually Chong. But what I found when I was searching, I mainly came across Quinlan, the Irish form of it. And even he was sometimes called John Quinlan. Now, how do we find out about people? We go to the Ryerson Index, don't we? And when I looked up John Quinlan, I saw that there were notices right down the east coast of Australia. So what had he done that he's all over... The papers. And then I saw one of the notices. Scourge of the 1950s establishment. <laughs> Heavens, I've just got to find out about this bloke. Um, and then, now this is a database we've got, which you can ask the staff about. It's a staff-only one, not because the staff want to monopolise it, but because there are clearly conditions that we're limited by. And it won't have births, deaths and marriages in it. And in a lot of those private notices we might be looking for, but it will have an obituary. And we found when we put just Quinlam in that we found an obituary and also someone had written into the paper basically saying he was a good bloke, remember those times. And the person who wrote the obituary, and it's a, a wonderfully informative obituary, uh, Professor Peter Edwards, and he, he gives us the kind of details we want in an obituary. When he was born, where, when he died, etc. And we find out that he went to Queensland University without the, the scholarship, that he edited the university paper Semper Floriat, and that he certainly wasn't holding back on challenging the... Um, uh, the establishment, and in fact, according to Professor Peter Edwards, uh, it was probably one of the most challenging times, which is interesting for the 50s because we tend to think of the 60s and 70s as being more like that. He developed an interest in Unitar Unitarian theology. He did some um, journalistic work and publication. And in fact, when we looked at some of our literary databases, we discovered a couple of the things that he'd written. He also became, not unsurprisingly, very interested in anything to do with the Chinese in Australia. And at that stage, it was only his brother, Frank, who was still alive. But certainly a very interesting person. So when I discovered that, I said, well, it's got to go into the Ryerson Index. It's at this, so we had that added... Um, what we've discovered is it's really up to the indexes whether they put the obituaries in. And, of course, not all of them are relevant to Australia, but that one certainly is. And it's an example of where it completes a story. And so that was what we looked at to find that story. It was incredibly simple, despite the difficulty of the names not being on the um, official registry records. So that brings us to the point about obituaries. They can be very, very useful because age and birthplace is there, names of family members. It also helps that his son, even though he's taken on the parents split and the son took on his mother's name, Bowen, but he's a blogger. So that also helped, by the way. Um, it gives you the family members' names, how long they were in a place, the jobs which they did, whether they were involved in community activities. And we know that if they were, they're more likely to be in, in you know, there's more likely to be an obituary. And the important events, and a point that Professor Edwards made was it was a, an ef event that defined his life. It wasn't the only example of discrimination, but it was the most significant one. P 
personally, I think anyone who took on what he did and told told everybody that he'd been sold the propaganda was going to survive. But anyway, it can also give us the name of the immigrant ship, which is something many of us are after, if it's applicable. But they're not always accurate. We know that names can be horrendously misspelled. Um, major things can be misremembered, uh, especially if sources are not first-hand. People's lives can be romanticised. People are not seamen. They are the commanders. They are the ship's captains. We know all this. Um, so, you know, you've always got to cross-check and they mightn't mention a divorce. There was a stage where a divorce was just about the most, you know, there's murder, rape, divorce, illegitimacy. Those things, of course, aren't the case now, but there was a time when they were. The next one, anyone who's known me for the last few years would have known I've been pursuing this. And there's now been a book written, but, you know, the issue goes on. John Leake was our first VC. And the question is, what can we find out about him? First VC, surely we can find out this should be so easy. And what happened to his first wife? We, we're all aware that um, after war, a lot of those marriages that took place during the war tended to end. And this was a case where it did. And this brings me to this John Leake. What was he like? Is everyone aware of the World War I portraits which have gone up on the web? Yeah, I've got one. Lovely. <laughs> now, I mentioned before that the Boer War ones, which were um, indexed in 1999, we don't have them up on the web, just an index to them. But the World War I um, images are. Now, initially it was thought that the Trove ones would be an adequate copy, but then if you've looked at them, you'd find that they're not. So it was decided to go back to the hard copy and do high quality tips from the originals. Now to find those, just to reiterate, you can find much more than books and their place on the shelves. Lots of photos there, documents and books. If when you go to OneSearch, which is our catalogue, you were to select something like all items and just put in leak, a surname, because often the initials are what goes with it, and you know that they're going to—they're likely to be confused. Leak and soldier, and then go to digitised collections, and then basically follow the instructions. So there it comes up: Private John Leak, one of the soldiers, photographed in the Queensland Pictorial Supplement online access. It means you can look at it on the internet, at our website. And there it is. And Queensland's first VC. There are other photographs of him, lots of them, of course, because he was a star. But note up here in the corner the instructions for downloading. See the little arrow? Download. And then it just tells you that we're committed to as, as great an access as we can possibly provide. And so it tells you how to download it and you can get the high-quality TIFF and it's copyright free. Now let's take a look at it. The one from the Queenslander is much, much better than a number of them are. But it's nowhere near as good as the one that's been digitised from the original. And now if you can find that from your relative, you've got a good quality photo. I mean, you, you don't have to go and pay for one. You can just download it yourself. So, and you get it from the catalogue. Select digitised images, use the surname, use the word soldier. And you might say, oh yes, but everyone's got the same name. What do I do? Well, go to the service records at National Archives. See when he enlisted and obviously look before then. They're not all there, by the way, sadly. But... What's going on internet-wise is trying to make as many links as possible with relevant resources. So when you go there to look at this leak, soldier, dig digitised collections, look over on the right side 
uh, you can display the item, you can view in Discovering Anzacs. Is everyone aware of Discovering Anzacs? National Archive site, you can add your own information. So you can go, you can, you've got these links all the time coming up. Be alert to them when you look around the screen. You can also, because they were done as pages, look at all the portraits and you can view the Queenslander on Trove or you can order a copy. So you've got a lot of things there that you can use if you choose to. And a, a, another point, just be aware there's so much more on the catalogue. So where and when was John Legge born? Now, this was going to be simple, wasn't it? Go to his service record. Yeah, near the town of Portsmouth, Hampshire. He's 22 years, 11 months. He was a team star. We see that the next of kin's crossed out. Not George Leake, now May Chapman. All seems to be solved. We found the record. Not quite. Now, this is when I was originally doing this, there was not a lot on Trove. And I thought, now, hang on, he married someone from Wales. Betcha the local studies librarians got material. And then we start to find records which contradict it. And, of course, I'm saying, well, you know, we're trying to find out about this John Lee who married somebody from Wales. In the Western Mail, September 1916, he said he was looking for his mother's family in Wales, Mountain Ash in Wales. And he was born in Queensland. So, you know, the local studies librarian shoots straight back at me. Why aren't you looking in Queensland? Um, obviously, I've looked. I've even looked at church records. I've looked at every other state. I've looked at immigration records. So when he's overseas, he's saying he's born in Queensland. When he's in Queensland, he's saying he was born in Portsmouth, Hampshire. Very interesting. This one, there's got to be some way of sorting this one out, surely. And she sends me a cutting from one of their newspapers. You know, not a very good quality, even though this was sent as a tiff. We're talking a couple of years ago now. And here they all are leaving after he's been awarded his VC. And look at the ladies in their hats and all the things that they have. And here he is, you know, Private Leake's father and mother hail from, you know, Bryn Mawr and Cardiff. They left Wales 30 years ago. And eight years later, the VC hero was born. Now, I've started to realise he was born anywhere in the 1890s as far as the records are concerned. Now, he married again in 1927 as William John Edward Leake. Then, on his marriage record, he was born in Canada. <laughs> Parents, James Leake Farmer and mother, Sarah Wilson. So, we now have three options. I'm obviously looking at immigration records. can find a George Leake. Can't find a birth for him anywhere. And some, suddenly something which seems so straightforward isn't. So was it Portsmouth, Canada, New South Wales? Well, other stages, it's New South Wales. So when did they immigrate? No record. I've chased John Leakes all over the place. And there are stacks of them. We even have one as a volunteer up there in family history. Oh. He's been wrestled to the ground and every detail extracted, <laughs> it goes without saying. There's stacks of them. But we cannot track this one. And when he died, his children put place of birth unknown. But, of course, one of the starting points, you know, there are lots of wonderful photos at the Australian War Memorial, was this beautiful photo. And there he is holding the hands of this lady that the Cardiff newspaper had, you know, walking away. And she told me that, of course, it was at um, Buckingham Palace. And I can see the gates of Buckingham Palace in the background. But he said, he supplied the photo, surrounded probably by friends and family at Portsmouth. Well, that doesn't fit in with what I've heard in the Cardiff, from the Cardiff um, Local Studies Librarian. And then I saw that the, um, on, on, um, the South Australian Chronicle had a record of this. And at that stage, it wasn't on trove, but I went down and I had a look at it when I was in South Australia. They had this same one, and of course, you can see it all over trove now, that it was outside the gates of Buckingham Palace. 
And of course, I tackled the um, Australian War Memorial and they said, but he provided that information. That would have to be correct. I said, I think that's the problem. <laughs> so finally, they, they conceded that this was Beatrice May Chaplin, uh, Chapman. And of course, I had all the stuff from um, the people in Cardiff as well. And every time John Leake came to Cardiff, you know, it was recorded. So, he married Beatrice May Chapman in Wales in 1918, in December. He returned to Australia without her and he remarried in 1927 as a bachelor. <laughs> so, we now know that there are... We now know that we can't really rely on any version of this and we can't track down the real thing. But the original question is, what happened to this first wife? All over the Cardiff Papers... And now we discover all over the Australian ones. What happened to her? And we all know the value of the censuses, tracking people. 1911, here she is highlighted, Beatrice M. Chapman, 13. She's at school. Here she is, and this, of course, is one of the joys of the service records, what we might not expect. It tells us, this is a copy of the marriage record and it has got none of the fabulous detail that we naturally expect from what we hold, but it does give us her age of 21. So somewhere between April and December, I'm inclined to trust poor old Beatrice May, she'd had a birthday. And it was in April to December 1897. Now, this is fantastic. I, I think I've probably told you, I'm, I've gone crazy over the General Register Office. Barely did we find out that it was available, this online index, then we got it straight up onto our useful websites. Now, I know her mother is Elizabeth Bellamy. So there she is, Beatrice May Chapman, year 1897, plus or minus, because I'm not sure when they, you know, always try to keep it wider rather than tighter. She was born in Cardiff, and I know her mother's name, her mother's maiden name is Bellamy. And there it is, December quarter, volume 11A, page 302, totally sealed in my memory. I've only been looking for years for this. When I look for her on FreeBMD, there she is. But I want to know who it is who married John Leake. And I've got other clues as to who might. Now, there's one thing that really means I can't eliminate the other one, September 1897. And that is you get six weeks to register a birth. So she could have been born as early as August 1897 and then registered in the December quarter. They don't give the exact date, which is, I suppose that's how they make their money, really. But anyway, what, this is sort of, and this, well, we can never be sure. I'm about 80% certain I've got her, but not 100%. She was on the electoral roll up to 1935 with her parents at their address. She's off the electoral roll with her parents after that. And in March, the March quarter of 36, a Beatrice May Chapman married a Leonard Herbert Williams. Now, you'd like to think that was her, wouldn't you? It would make it so neat. You've got to ask, though, is it her marriage? And this is where the 1939 register comes in. Is everyone familiar with the 1939 register? It's that wonderful link that we've been missing, a great interwar thing. It was the basis for the UK identity card during the war um, and everyone was registered on the 29th of September 1939. They were issued on the spot and lasted until 1952. So they were adding information in that time. It makes it very, very useful. And find my past, not surprisingly, because they have the record one of the most important documents in the 20th century in Britain. And, of course, it is, it, because it fills that important gap between 1911 and 1939. So, like a census, it gives you the names, the, dress, the addresses, the jobs, whether they're married or not. 
all household members are included, but those who weren't 100 at the time of the release are blocked out. Those records are closed. You can apply to have them open because obviously a lot of those people will be dead, but they are closed. And every now and again, I'm sure they're going to release more of them. They've released some already. But they have information additional to a census because it continued till 1952. So women's name changes. You know, all those irritating things. Oh, did she marry him? Did she marry him? There they are, crossed out the name over it. And whether they're married, divorced, occupational changes. So, for example, uh, Winston Churchill went from First Lord of the Admiralty to Prime Minister. Precise dates of birth, but of course we always know that for women it should always be what we think it should be rather than, what is it called? I heard this beautiful term last night, post-truth. I love it. <laughs> Ages are, often become post-truth, what we would like them to be. Okay, but information on census records just not on the 1939 register, relationships. You can guess that, you know, they're the children or that's the husband and wife, but they're not shown. And the middle names are rarely in full and places of birth aren't listed, which is, you know, again for us, important. And it's on Find My Past and you can find it on that top bar up here. And there are a couple of ways into it. I'm just going to put Beatrice M. Williams, 1897 and so on. And I looked and I had a look at both of them and obviously I came to the one that most clearly matched. And so this is the Williams household. There's Beatrice M., birth year 1897. Yes, that puts her in the right year. Uh, and it was quite unusual for women of that age to be marrying as a first marriage. Normally they were in, in that place, they were marrying in their late teens or early 20s. So, you know, that in itself does tend to narrow the possibilities, but certainly doesn't seal it. Um, and it tells us there's Lily M. Williams and one more person, unlock this household. So I don't know why you have to unlock it, why you just don't click on it, but, you know, be that as it may. We unlocked it. And it tells us that Beatrice M is there, 4th of September, 1897. There's her mother-in-law, Lily, and there's Leonard. Then you can click on view the original record and this is where you get it. And you'll keep coming across this UDD, Unpaid Domestic Duties. Now, Clementine Churchill, that was hers. She wasn't the Prime Minister's wife, she was UDD, Unpaid Domestic Duties. I doubt that she was actually doing them. She'd married this Leonard Herbert, who was a coke oven worker, and Beatrice was unpaid domestic duties. So there are reasons to think there's a link, but we sort of love to say it is her, but... Mm. Then looked at the death of Beatrice May Williams. I found this through Ancestry. Couldn't use free BMD because it hasn't gone that far. It, we know that she is that person on the 1939 register, and we know that she is the one who married Leonard Herbert uh, Williams, and that's her exact date of birth. So we can track her. There's one record that we're just not sure about. So if we put them together, up the top we have the marriage, March 36, straight after she disappears from her parents' um, house, according to the electoral register, there she is within a range that is consistent with the one we're looking for and there's her death. And her birth record is what we really need to prove whether or not it's her because we cannot exclude this one up here. This Beatrice May may have been born even after her and simply registered promptly. But if we want to know for sure what we do is get that record because that will give her date of birth and her father. And, you know, well, it's certainly the date of birth is what we're after. And we know who, who the father is now because we know who the mother is. Well, in theory. 
Okay, so the 1939 register is on Find My Past. We've got a subscription, so it's free on site. You can also um, put in a request through the Ask Us service at the footer of any of the pages. It's in the third column, services, and it's the third one down. This is one we got four inquiries about. Now, I don't know to what extent they were the same person. But, you know, I don't know whether you ever did that exercise at school where you got a half-torn document and you had to write the story of the document. Let me assure you there's nothing more tantalising than an incomplete document. And especially if you're looking at something maybe you've purchased or that you've got taken a big interest in. So this block of flats was built by Mrs Evelyn Thomason. And what was the, the story of this block of flats? And who was this Mrs Thomason? That's the article. And I later discovered that it wasn't gracious Eversham in the article, it was spacious Eversham. But of course, you're looking furiously all over Trove, you're looking for Eversham, you're looking for Quarry Street, for Hamilton, you're looking at the possible date range through this great morass of crease and um, blurred text. What it said, and we've got a whole lot of... Um, articles on homes and this was one of the ones in the clipping files extract from the sunday mail circa 1937 well it wasn't and how did we find this out basically it comes there, there was a, a section in the telegraph the sunday mail the courier mail which covered houses i tagged every one of them put them in date order found one missing for the Sunday Mail, contacted Fryer, the Parliamentary Library and National Library, and it wasn't this one. So where was it? And, of course, it, there are people who've written about a lot of these places, and we got them onto the job. We couldn't find it. I'd started looking at the truth, but the truth doesn't consistently use the same style. You start looking for things like the text, and how these things, the fonts, how they're written, what the layout's like. But then the truth started to come up and I could see that they did occasionally use it. I was able to work out from here that it had to be around about July because that's when Mrs Thomason moved in. And I started looking for the first articles I could find on it. Much to my utter, utter astonishment, my aunt had given a party for, her, for somebody who was getting married and I thought well that can't be them there are just so many Mary Ryans then I looked up the electoral rolls and saw that my father and my grandmother were there and I thought what are they doing having a high old time when they've got a house here at Highgate Hill but anyway I knew that the conventions of the time would have been that they wouldn't have written about that without acknowledging the owner first so this is the what the article actually looked like and I can tell you exactly when I found it, which was the 1st of August last year, because I'd worked out exactly when it must have been from, th from that putting that time frame on it. And I thought they better not put it up on Trove immediately because I've spent ages on this. It wasn't until November. But that's when I discovered, of course, that the title had, had been... They tried to fill it in. It wasn't gracious, it was spacious. But tagging can be a very, very useful way of creating your own personal bibliography. And I'm sure a number of you have done it. And it's a good way of trying to narrow where, where something might have been. And, of course, it's a beautiful insight into the time. Here is the, the lounge room. She had a, a three- or four-bedroom um, flat there. It was a beautiful block of flats, still there. Um, they're all like individual residences with their own entries, um, laundries and garages. Most unusual for the time. It looks like one house, but it's four. And there is all her beautiful furniture, flowers. And, I mean, m many of you would remember when having a lovely garden and, and flowers in a vase was just the most critical thing you had to have when you were having visitors, you know. None of this kind of plastic stuff. So anyway, we finally found it in, on, on the truth, in the truth, 11th of July, 1937, page 28. 
And it was largely through trying to put a limit on the time, um, the time limit of when it could have appeared and just searching all the options till we got it. And if there hadn't have been four queries, we mightn't have bothered, but there were four. And here's Mrs. Thomason, Mrs. Evelyn Thomason. You know, she went off to Salon and she was reported in the papers. She ended up doing quite well. But, you know, what was this woman's background? Incidentally, the week was the weekend version of the telly. You all remember the telegraph? Yep. So that was the weekend version. And that's where they'd have a lot of the feature articles and photographs. Her grandfather, Louis Lowe, had arrived in Victoria during the gold rushes. Now, here she is living in Queensland. A reminder, you know always to look at every state. Never believe that life begins and ends in Queensland. People moved around and the gold rushes were a, a magnet for Victoria. He moved to New South Wales and he then eventually to Queensland in 1874. You will have no difficulty finding Louis Lowe. He is all over the papers. He had a whole lot of businesses. He was constantly in court, always in trouble, always going broke publicly. So his, his daughter, Goethe, was Evelyn's mother. So Goethe would obviously probably be a bit keen to escape that background that had followed Louis all the way up the East Coast. And she married someone called George Horseman in 1879. And he was from a place called Eversham in, in Worcestershire and announced it. They might be living in Cooktown, but it was in the, in the Courier Mail or the Brisbane Courier as it was at the time. He, George was the eldest son of George Horseman, Esquire of Eversham Park, Eversham, marrying Goethe Augusta. A little bit of issue. We all know that, don't we? We're going to find issues with spelling. That Goethe will be spelt at least three or four different ways, as will Augusta, as will Evelyn. And when Evelyn was their eldest daughter, and they were obviously very proud, here they were up in Cooktown, but it went into the courier. She was the eldest of six children. I'm going to just do a little bit of a chronology to see that there was quite a lot happening in Evelyn's life over a few years. Now, he had a licence for the Dunmore Arms in Rockhampton, but then it's reported that his wife's taking over the licence. And that this happened from time to time and he was unwell. And But Evelyn was a violin teacher and she was always in the paper. She was giving concerts, she was being commended for her musical background. And she was no wimp. Someone knocked her off a bike in East Street Rocky. She sued. She might have been 21, but... And then she went off to London. You know, this is big time stuff for a kid from Rocky. 1904, George Horseman left the hotel and went to Sydney. 1906, a, a sister of Evelyn's died very tragically. Um, and there were charges of manslaughter against the nurse. It was all over the papers. The truth loved it. And... Uh, and uh, Evelyn returned then to Brisbane and married Henry Thomason. He was a chemist, a widower with children, and they had their own children. And 1907, the father suicided in Sydney, and I think you could sort of see from the newspapers. They certainly didn't lead their lives quietly. It was all over the paper. The mother had obviously left him. He was obviously suffering mental health issues. And he basically went off the gap having shot himself. So there was a lot going on in her life, but you can see a fairly resilient woman taking it on. But there was obviously that link to a father. In 1907, Evelyn and her husband bought Eversham, a pretty little villa, it's described in the papers, on the Rathdenell estate. And a few, four years later, she sold that little house and bought the Rathdenell estate. Is everyone aware that we have these wonderful real estate maps? They're going up 
at the rate of 20 a month and you go in through one search, just constantly repeating the point, one search is more than a way to find books. You can find those maps. You can find, get some idea of when the property, probably where you live, was subdivided and up for auction. Big events, you know, chicken transport. Gee, I would have been there all, every weekend, I think. And when you look at this little tiny red square, see this little tiny weeny one here? That's that first Eversham. And we know where it's come from, where her father is from, despite his distress. She named that after her father's place of origin. And there's Rathdonnell or Rathdonnell. And it was, you know, um, sold in 1911 and, and Evelyn bought it. And there is the advertisement in the paper. They've called it Ebersham, always an issue with trove. We're all alert to it, aren't we? Use lots of different terms because there's all sorts of spelling issues. Poor optical recognition is also an issue as well as incorrect spelling. And that was a little dodgy, that one. There are pictures of houses you can find through one search with those digitised images. There is the original home. I don't believe we've got one after Evelyn had done it up. That's from Trove. But she added the flats. She was obviously a woman who was not going to be financially insecure. But we've also got lots of other things in clipping files as well as photographic files. So we can see the pictures of her first house, Eversham, and then, of course, um, the Rath Rathdonnell estate. <coughs> During World War I and World War II, this was a really big period for uh, flat building. And certainly Hamilton was one of the centres of it. And she built the next Eversham, which was this series of flats at Quarry Street, Hamilton. They're still there. Um, and they were, they were designed by Mervyn Rylance, Spanish mission style, appearance of one home, four distinct residents, with all sorts of little added extras. And, of course, you know, when they would describe these things in the paper, they'd tell you they've got gas and all sorts of things like that, and electricity, as if these are breathlessly new things, which they were, and refrigerators. And there was endless entertainment. She supported virtually every activity going around the place. And a description of the social activity is fascinating to read. There'd be music, dainty treats, choice flowers. The flowers were a big deal and beautiful frocking. And the frocking would go into details of colours and styles and fabrics and the list of guests. And I thought, God forbid you've left anybody out because Brisbane was pretty small. So she, had, she did a lot of support for community activities. You never, ever fail to find Evelyn Thomason or Evelyn Horseman in the paper. So you get the impression of a very strong, very capable woman, despite what for many would have been significant setbacks. And so there it is from the truth. And there is the lounge re which reflects her interests with its piano, pride of place, with its flowers, with its social sort of arrangement of the furniture. And she died there in her 90th year, having lived... a a varied life, certainly in some respects quite tragic, and she was able to do that from building those flats. And we'd, we've done a blog on it, and of course one of the people interested has got a photograph of where someone visiting um, Australia who was a singer who discovered the, um, you know, the Sound of Music people couldn't bear to stay in a hotel, so she left her home and um, made her, her flat um, available to this singer. So that was a little addition that we got from, from one of our commentators. And I think we're, now we're due to have a bit of a break, but I'm wondering if we might have a break now rather than in 10 minutes. So that oh, it's only a 10 minute break, so we can all just um, gather our breath and gather our strength and check our notes. So we might just take that break now. If, is that okay? 
Okay. Okay, right, we're right. Okay, Charlie's very keen that I mention to you, um, just following up on that statement how from Find My Past, about how the 1939 register is so important in the 20th century. The, the 1921 census is not going to be available um, and for 100 years because of legislation controlling it. The 1931 census was destroyed during the uh, war and the 1941 census wasn't taken. So for all of those reasons, it's a critical record, apart from the fact that I'm trying to use it to sort out Beatrice May Chapman. So it is an important one and you can find it on Find My Past. Now, the next story has got the quality of Monty Python's ripping yarns. If you didn't actually see the records, I don't think you'd believe it. I read it with a certain element of disbelief. And in 1937, these two brothers, um, Frederick and Dallam, were charged with stealing and blackmail. And it was pretty sensational because, um, well, who's going to be involved? It brought Brisbane to the Supreme Court right across the social scale. But also, the eldest son was meant to inherit a baronetcy. His father, Sir Frederick, was living here. And the flats where it happened were a colourful story all on their own, to the point that we have a photo, we have a painting, sorry, of those um, flats, the Avalon flats, and there's a book on them. So what happened to the Afflecks and the baronetcy and did I put Lord there? That should be Sir Frederick. Sorry, I don't know how I can do how I did that. Must be old age. Sir Frederick and Lady Affleck. He was a baronet after all. So the Affleck brothers ran a vice club for jaded businessmen. Clue no women involved in the Avalon Flats. And they also blackmailed the jaded businessmen, who obviously don't want anyone to know about it. These flats were lettered, you know, A through to Z. A young man was brought to the flat, knocked unconscious and photographed in a compromising position. Now, it was only a young man. A lot of people would have given in, but he went to the police and then it all hit the fan. There are the Avalon flats still there today and that is the scene of the... And naturally, it's going to be in truth, isn't it? Um, you know, the scene of the crime. You can see the camera in the cupboard. It's also an interest... I find it interesting because it shows how much simpler things were in the way of decoration then. It looks like a very unexciting bed to me, but then, you know... You know, th this is... Th the papers loved it. Abs and, of course, the truth revelled in it. Hang on, have I just gone too far there? No, I haven't. That's the painting by Leslie Edwards, which the State Library holds. I don't think it's online, but you can find it listed on the catalogue. And again, you know, we've talked about um, Mrs Thomason's flats. Huge fat flat building between the wars and certainly in New Farm. And Hall and Prentice later went on to do the City Hall, designed these 26 rather small one-bedroom flats, not on the same scale as Eversham by any means. And you can find out about how colourful this place was if you want to go up to John Oxley and read the book. Now, I'd love to think that we can always trust de Bretts and Burks. I'd love to think it. And we tend to revere them because these are so much more important people than we are. Sir Frederick Danby James Affleck was the eighth baronet, born the 3rd of February, 1856. And he was the successor to his cousin in 1919. He married, according to this record, on the 3rd of January 1904, Lily, also known as Elizabeth Annie when you look at the Queensland um, registry, a daughter of Alfred Corm Ross and has issue. And those issue 
are Frederick James Sadata, born 29th of March 1905, and Dallam Robert, born the following year. Now, that's from Burke's Will I Ever Trust It? Now, Elizabeth Annie had four marriages, only two of them actually legal. Firstly, in 1899, she married a Lionel Lawrence Green. That's on the registry records. We can see that although she's reported as having a cut-glass English accent and her wonderful English ancestry, she was actually born in Queensland. Okay, she then, according to de Bretts and Burks, married Frederick Danby James Affleck in 1904. Now, the only problem is she's got a husband who's alive. Okay, in 1918, she marries him according to the Registry of Births, Deaths and Marriages in 1918. Both of those marriages are illegal because she discovers her husband is still alive. And then in 1939, she marries Frederick Danby James Affleck again. Obviously, she's trying to make, make sure that her son can inherit. Now, the Affleck births are fascinating. When you see a 1939 registration on the registry website, you know that it's a late registration because they simply don't release births at that date. Now, Elizabeth Annie, also known as Lily, married in 1939, according to the registry and that was a, a legal marriage. Her children are registered in that year as well, Frederick James Siddhartha and Dallam Robert Affleck, both registered sequential numbers in 1939, even though they're born in 1905 and 1906. And they also had a daughter, Pansy, whom they registered, but she died, so she's obviously not going to come into the scene too much. And you can find all of these sorts of websites through our useful websites by going to useful websites, Queensland and then the registry. And this is where the electoral rolls become very interesting because I'm trying to work this mess out. All these marriages, strange births, where are these people living for goodness sake? Well, according to the Queensland electoral rolls, in 1903, 1905 and 1908, Lily was living with her husband at McConnell Street, Spring Hill. And Frederick Danby James was living in Wynnum and Crow's Nest. But they had three children. Where was she living? I mean, can I ever trust the electoral rolls again? I reckon she was living with him. Uh, with with um, Sir Frederick. But I also know that if you're going to have children, you've got to be hanging around your husband a bit, not, you know, in McConnell Street, Spring Hill. I don't think I can trust that, that first entry for the Greens on the electoral roll. Her husband was a steward, a marine steward, so he would often be away. And then we start to see a picture of where they were moving. Now, Frederick... Um, Danby James, came out as a steward. He was one of those people who didn't really manage his affairs well. One Tattersall's bought a Queen Street property, it went bust. And basically he was just running little farming things. And here we see him, you know, 15, 16 up to 19 on the Maroochee River. Then he's at Budrum. Then he ends up sadly at Dunwich. He was virtually blind and then later on we find Lily at Seaville Avenue, Scarborough. A very modest arrangement. So we get a bit of a, a brief scan of their lives. Life wasn't easy. These are the two sons. And of course, you know, the papers just adore all this. There's Frederick James Affleck, heir to a baronetcy, declared... I mean, he had a huge criminal record by this time this came up in Queensland... And a New South Wales judge had said that um, he was in a, a blackmail plot and he was a habitual criminal. In other words, this is what he did, really. That was his life. And there was a second brother, uh, Dallam Robert. And, of course, they were making much 
of the aristocratic background because they really want to counterpoint this seedy operation with the awe of their having this wonderful background. And, of course, when people commit crimes, there are ways of, to explain it, and it's the curse of the Afflecks. I mean, this is where it becomes really Python-esque because, you know, it was said if you sold the house, you were never going to prosper and those who, who um, you know, were in Dallam Hall... The man who bought Dallam Hall did not live a year and his son who inherited the property died within a few months. And, you know, that's it really, isn't it? And it goes on to say how Sir Frederick didn't prosper from his Tattersall sweep. And, oh, look, you lost everything. I mean, that's why things go wrong. Curses. But that's not the end of this drama. When Sir Frederick died, while his sons were in jail, and, of course, the papers adore all this, the saddest funeral that's taken place to Tuong Cemetery for many a day was that of the 8th Baronet. Behind the hearse were two cars. One was a hired car. Its occupants were Dallam Robert Affleck and his aged mother. In the front seat beside the driver sat a warder. In the car behind was a policeman in plain clothes. And, of course, the heir couldn't go because he had neuritis and was too sick and couldn't leave the jail. Now, here's Lady Affleck. I worship at the shrine of his memory. Every day she'd put flowers next to his pipe. And, you know... It goes on about how she's so cheerful in the face of adversity and she's going to give a wonderful story about her life. She calls Sir Frederick Sir. And spoken to after she'd accompanied her younger son, the Dowager Lady Affleck said she used the name of Mrs Hanford to preclude discussion of her title. Her sons also used it for less um, honourable reasons. She described her secret hope that one day it may be possible for surgeons to perform an operation which will lift a bone pressing on the brain of the present baronet and which, so his mother believes, causes him to perform the most atrocious criminal acts and bear an unenviable title in official and police circles. So that's the other thing. He fell when he was young and so there's something pressing on his brain so he can't control his criminal... And I'm sort of thinking, hang on. This is, so he's really a criminal because of the curse of the Affleck and because of this bone pressing. What about the other brother? Okay. And this is, of course, Lady Affleck. Incorrigible rogue, burglar, blackmail, thug. Affleck succeeds to the title by right of birth. But realising he's dishonoured an honourable name, he does not wish to claim the title, Lady Affleck explains. That's not the son's point of view. A title is not of much use without money, but when my present circumstances alter, that is, when I get out of jail, um, I may go to England and meet some of my relatives who are quite wealthy people. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I were his relatives, I'd be a bit worried. I mean, they really were crooks. You know, that was what they did. And, of course, it's assumed that the son inherited it. He succeeded to the title. He and his brother will spend nearly three more years in jail. The eighth baronet died last week, etc. But, in fact, there you've got to apply for these titles. And if you look at the um, National Archives UK and you put in just his name, Frederick James Sadata Affleck, there is a file. Now, you know, I'm not prepared to order that file, which will no doubt will cost a lot of money, but Nick Kingsley, who's got a bit of an interest in landed families, had a look at it, and you can see it wasn't settled until 1949, ten years after. By registering the births and the marriage in 39, it was considered legitimate in England, in Queensland, but it stopped short of allowing him to inherit... He was rather coy about explaining why. I think we can all have a bit of a guess. So, just a reminder, sometimes you could, these days you can look much wider than Queensland, much wider than Australia, 
and you can find some of these records which give you a clue. He didn't inherit the title. He died at eventide. His father died at the earlier version of Dunwich. He'd been absent from the electoral roll. Whether he was there under some sort of um, pseudonym, I don't know. The brother Dallam took a name from his mother's first husband. And, of course, it's easy enough to find them on the Queen's the Queensland um, registry by putting in the father's name and the mother. Well, the father is enough, really. Um, and he died up at Wide Bay. He was a fisherman and sort of a rather sad, a rather sad end to a family. And just to say the least, almost a bizarre end. Just a bit of a, an overview of what we've looked all of this is really to highlight what you can find at the State Library. If you go to resources, family history, e-resources and useful websites, there's a lot of material that you can find that is free and easy to search. Um, certainly, I haven't mentioned it because we're, I was aware of time would, would be running out. But another clue when you're trying to find out when someone has died is obviously to look at the Brisbane Grave Location Search or the many um, burial sites we've got on useful websites. National Archives Australia is becoming... It's just wonderful for the records that's, that are available, especially for people who came to Queensland. The World War I service records hold lots of surprises. Didn't necessarily sort things out in the case of John Leake. The War Memorial has got wonderful documents and photographs. Ryerson can be very useful. Newspapers on Trove, those not on Trove. You probably know Trove's come to a bit of a standstill unless people are prepared or um, councils or whatever are prepared to pay for those records to go up. We have clipping files that we keep up in John Oxley under um, a whole lot of different subject headings places and surnames. Now, Quinlan wasn't there and I certainly didn't find the Afflex that I was after, but I get lots of others that can be very, very useful. And we do have a number of databases and indexes we're constantly trying to work on. Don't forget, useful websites also includes the British Isles, like National Archives UK. UK. Free BMD is good. I love free BMD, but it doesn't go quite as far as sometimes Ancestry and, of course, the General Registry Office online with giving you the mother's name for births and deaths is great. Um, other things that you can find through the catalogue, books even. I feel like I've got to say, even. Uh, but we can you can find a whole series of books. Real estate maps, and 20 are going on per month. Books such as the one on Avalon, artwork such as Avalon, photographs like the World War I images, but lots of other photographs of houses and people. Um, also, under databases, you can go to the Family History homepage and connect, or you can go um, even through just databases and then Family History. Find My Past, which we have here, but only on site, as with Ancestry, 1939 Register. And now, questions. Charlie, there should be a handheld mic somewhere. Is there a handheld mic or not? Do we have a handheld mic? Or? Okay, if we don't, um, if you could just give us your questions and I can repeat them. Any questions? Yes. Okay, the question was, do we have any records on the Wacol immigration camp? You're talking about post-World War II, is that right? Okay, that would have been run as um, a Commonwealth initiative and so they will be at National Archives. But, you know, there are more and more things coming on regarding uh, 20th century immigration, especially for Queensland. You can even find photographs... And for those of you who may not be aware, they're actually um, trying to upgrade the National Archives website so that it will be easier to go between the records. Right now, you could be going to basic search, name search, 
passenger lists to find things. It should be easier to make those links. But also, if you're going, have a look on the catalogue uh, on the National Archives record search. But, you know, I'd give them a ring before going out because they're only open just a certain number of days because they're digitising. But I'd be surprised if you couldn't find at least something. Any other questions? Yes. Army Chaplain's records. Well, I think some of them could be online, but we have them on fiche upstairs. GRO records, um, Army Chaplain's upstairs. Yep. But it's only an index, and as you know, the English indexes are not great. Uh, but if you've got that, and I, I actually have not searched that new GRO index online, to, you know, to see if it includes that. But you've got your contact details there. Okay, any other questions? Yes. But I can't find him on any immigration shipping lists or anything else so far. Have you got any hints as to where to go next? <laughs> okay. And so you've looked at people leaving the UK? Yes. You've looked at every state here? Yes. When is the last time you find him on a census? Um, in the UK. I can't find him on any census in the UK either. Or his parents. Okay, that's interesting. So do we know if he came from the UK? Well, according to the marriage certificate and his death certificate, he did. He did. Yeah, but... Okay. Yeah. It's <laughs> exactly the same as mine. Yeah. Um, I'm, I came out on the ship on the St James. Uh, he says on the marriage certificate, his mother and um, father lived in England. Would you like to just take the mic? The father... Um, he said he was, born, he was born in England, London, England, and his father was a seaman and his mother's name was Bridget Murphy, but I can't find any of them anywhere. We've been everywhere. I think he just told fibs on his... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we just can't, we've been trying for years. Yeah. Well, there are name change, yeah. name changes yeah. for all sorts of reasons. The other thing is sometimes they might have come via other areas, such yeah. as to New Zealand and then over right. to Australia. Yeah. We're probably not going to pick them up if they came directly to Queensland. Sometimes you can pick them up in New South Wales and you should be able to pick them up in Victoria. But we all know those records are not totally reliable. I was looking for a George Wright. Once I found out, or someone else found a hospital record at State Archives which gave a varying year of arrival and the name of the ship misspelled. But once we started doing a search on that, we could find him leaving the UK as G.A.C. Wright. And I thought, well, hang on, we've got the shipping list here. We should be able to find him. Don't ask me how it happened, but he was recorded as Mrs. G.S. Wright. <laughs> Now, it's hard yeah. to believe I know that mistakes can be made and it's hard for us to believe that people mightn't be totally honest and sometimes we don't always get the fact that they could have gone somewhere else first and it would never be that they were lining up with someone else in an um, illicit relationship. But, you know, there are a number of reasons why it can happen. Poor records, poor record, um, you know, in, inexact 
recording of the names and sometimes not always the purest of motives. Mm. But sometimes you find them. Like that George Wright was impossible to find until we found out that hospital record that linked him to a range of years and the name of the ship. Then we could get him and then find the error in the Queensland list. But there's obviously been, if you can't, he may have, they may, well, you say he came from the UK. Mm. There are a lot of things that aren't adding up, aren't they? Yes, there are, yeah. And we love to get those shipping records right, but it's not always possible. <laughs> and if you do, work on John Leake for me. Oh, OK. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to um, repeat that question because it's actually quite an important one. Um, this lady was looking at electoral records in the 1890s and it appears they had to re-register every year. What's really good about those some of those records is that they would publish them regularly in the paper and they would tell you where they first... Um, when they first went on the roll there. Yeah. They would tell you if they'd gone off because they'd moved or they'd died. Mm. They were supposed to keep them up to date, but I think we've already seen in the case of Lily uh, Elizabeth Annie, also known as Lily, um, Ross, also known as Green, also known as Affleck, also known as Mrs Hanford, that those records are not always correct. So they don't, they're not a real-time picture of what people are doing. But I don't think they had to register every year, but they would publish them regularly with updates. Right. It's just got a column on the left-hand side which has got dates in it and they look like the date of that year, but occasionally you'll get one that which the date is like several years prior yes. to that, so that might be that. Yes. But my problem is that I know where he was living and all of a sudden he disappears off the off the electoral roll. And that's why I was wondering, you know, how do I interpret that? I mean, does, I mean, his children were still in the same school, so one assumes that he was still living in the same land. Um, yeah, but, but you're saying his children are there, but he's the just school. disappeared. Yeah. yeah, he's not on the electoral roll. Well, yeah. we've got people who can hardly wait to tell you that he could have gone to jail or anything like that, or he could have had to go out. What years are we talking about? 1890s could have been the Depression. 1907 up mm. to about 1903. There's, a, there's problems in that area. Yeah. Look, people just weren't as diligent. They didn't realise we'd be searching for them. <laughs> or maybe they did. Maybe <laughs> somebody else was looking for them. <laughs> look, they're just not real-time images. Oh, okay. Look, and I'm... I'm I'm a derelict in that regard. I didn't change my electoral roll from 21 to 31. Even when I went on the roll, I was a, said I was a student. I was working by then, mm -hmm. even though I was a student when I enrolled. And, you know, you, you're going through these various jobs and moving around. But according to the electoral roll, I was staying at home as a student until I was 31. So well, you know, that finished when I was 21. So it's a problem for him. He, he perhaps has, has not done something you should have done. Yeah. We don't know. You know, there can be all sorts of reasons people disappear mm. off roles. Um, and it could be that he went to jail. It could be that for whatever reason he was moving around a lot, no point. Um, but it wasn't compulsory to yeah. be on the electoral roll right. either. Yeah, it was a property qualification, wasn't it? There, there was that. But also, you know, residents did have a few rights there as well. Um, I think that, you know, we just do not know. And when you look at post office directories and compare them to electoral rolls, often you'll find something quite different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been looking for a Mrs Alice Keogh who's in this place in a particular street every year. She's not. On, and, and there she is, obviously the head of the household. She's not on the electoral roll. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this is when women could be on. So they're, they're not... 
use them as a guide rather than as a real-time image of where people are would be my advice. And also you find that people go on and off in the 20th century at different times on the state and commonwealth roles. So there could be an election that, that prompts them to change, but then they don't change on the other one until, again, that comes up. So they're not as great as you want them to be, as we'd like them to be, yes. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, we've got this fan. The question was, I don't know how to look into the post office addresses. We have post office directories upstairs till 1949. They stop giving residential addresses after 1939. Now, again, are they real-time images? Often not. Um, but we have this fantastic thing we've just acquired called Queensland Publications... You can go to the CD-ROM machines, don't need a CD-ROM, search the lot and a hit, all of those, do an advanced search and look for someone, which is better than, you know, one CD-ROM after another or going to all the fiche. Again, just do a keyword search. But, you know, I find there's this constant discrepancy between electoral roles and between, between those and the post office directories. So you can come in here? You can come in here, yes. Look, we're out of time at this stage, but, you know, I would invite you to go up and have a look up on Level 3 at the Family History area. There are more information guides, and if you have any questions, the staff will be happy to answer them, and we're happy to give you a hand in doing your family history. Don't forget about Ask Us, which is there on the home page. And if you're not a member, this is a good prompt to go and join. Go to level one, go to level three. Well, you can, you can be a member without a card, but a card's really good if you come in and you want to do copying or you want to um, even just go to the photocopier and scan. And that is to say, save it to a memory stick. Okay? Thanks, everybody. <laughs>